Welcome to lecture 17 on robber barons, 1865 to 1914. Um, and this is really three interrelated stories. It's the story of America's second industrial revolution and major industrial takeoff, um, how workers responded to that, and then how farmers responded to that. So in 1865 to roughly about 1900, the United States becomes an industrial powerhouse. It's the leading industrial economy in the world, number one by 1900. What happens in that time period is the creation of national integrated markets. What I mean by that is markets for products across all of America, not just local sales of something that grandma makes in her little tiny town in Vermont. Um, it's a story of economic volatility where there are wild mood swings in the market. The market goes up and it goes down. There's increased prosperity and in the formation of massive incomes, um, massive concentration of wealth, but it's not shared equally. So while the rising tide lifts all of the folks' economic boats, some people get a bigger benefit than others. So what causes all of this to happen after the Civil War? Well, for first of all, we've already had a glimpse of it when we talked about railroad expansion to the West. Because the railroad connected the country, it helped create this national park market. Suddenly you could make a good in Pennsylvania and then ship it all the way to California. Technological innovation takes off in this time period. So Americans invent quite a number of products that enable them to dominate the world economically. There is government support. Contrary to a lot of popular belief, the United States government was actively involved in supporting this industrialization. It wasn't just the work of individual guys working on their own. Both government policies like tariffs as well as the patent system enabled industrialists to make fantastic fortunes and use the law and the politics of the time for their benefit. There's a cheap labor supply and the more people who come to America in this time period, the cheaper that labor supply becomes. Finally, or next to last, sorry, I think, is business reorganization. Companies grow into gigantic corporations, but doing so requires that they rethink how they govern themselves, how they organize, how they manage. And this rethinking enables companies to become larger and larger and larger. And last but not least, in fact, very, very important, is a pro-business ideology that says everything that the businessmen do is good, the industrialization is good for the nation, progress is good, innovation is good. And Americans tell themselves the story that there is pretty much no downside to what the industrialists are up to. We can see uh, just how much the change uh, between, you know, uh, an agricultural-based world and an industrial-based world is between 1870 and 1920. Um, this chart is workforce distribution. So it shows in 1870, 53% of Americans made their uh, money in agriculture and only 26% in manufacturing or transportation. By 1920, Manufacturing and transportation takes up 40% of the American economy and agriculture is down to 27% in terms of what people are doing for a living. You can see it also in this chart showing just how much these factories billowing with smoke uh, and booming with uh, labor contribute to the American economy. So this uh, chart shows the value added for every economic se sector in the United States and it's constant in 1879 prices uh, to account for inflation. You can see agriculture does add a lot of value. It rises up 
pretty much from just under two billion to about four billion dollars. But manufacturing has a much steeper rise from just over a billion dollars to over six billion dollars um, by 1899. Whereas construction and mining don't have as significant a growth. So in many ways these two tell twin stories about the the uh, 1865 to 1900 time period. Uh, a fight over America's future. Industry, agriculture. Industry, agriculture. And in the end manufacturing and industry win. When I said inventions, um, I meant all kinds of inventions from the passenger elevator to the sewing machine to the light bulb, the phonograph, and this invention here, which was part of the industrialized South. This is James Bonsack's automatic cigarette rolling machine, um, which allowed a worker to produce about 12,000 cigarettes an hour which brings back the entire tobacco industry of the South by making it possible for people to have access to cheap tobacco products. Bond Sachs was just many, one of many uh, patented uh, inventions during the Gilded Age of 1865 to 1900. You can see 1850 to 1859, there are 19,000 something patents, not a whole lot, like the passenger elevator of 1852. That number steadily grows over the time period to 1899 until there are 221,000 patented inventions in the United States. Um, so America's legal system protects your patent um, enables you to make a profit off of it and that helps increase the industrialization of this time period. I do want to spend some time on ideology because sometimes we overestimate the power of ideas but they're worth thinking about in this time period because they are the core values of the Republican Party. Republicans um, after the Civil War came to be a big pro-business political group um, valuing freedom of labor um, which they said that was the freedom to contract for labor um, the freedom to sell your labor to the highest bidder possible which gets a little bit harder to do the cheaper labor goes because it's generally possible you can always find somebody to work for cheap they construct a belief that capitalism is based on freedom and fairness. Um, and this idea um, helps sell Americans on the, the sort of understanding that whatever industrialization is going on, it's just natural, it's the right thing, it's American values, it's fair, and uh, it's, it's essentially good. Part of their thinking was something that we call laissez-faire. Um, it's this idea that government should be hands off of the economy. But in fact, there's no such thing as laissez-faire. Anytime a government makes a decision um, that in any way affects um, economic transactions, that's hands-on. So the question is not laissez-faire, but how much hands-off and who gets the benefit. Sometimes when governments stay out of the economy, it benefits one group of people over another group of people. And that's what Republicans in the 19th century meant when they said laissez-faire. They wanted the government to be pro-business and to not interfere when it would hurt businessmen but interfere when it would help them. A good illustration of that is the tariff. Tariffs were a tax on foreign imports. And if you were truly laissez-faire, you would not have a tax on foreign imports at all. You'd simply let your own businesses compete and let the market decide. But businessmen in the 19th century pushed Republicans to support tariffs because they said America's infant industries needed protection from the rest of the world. 
Finally, part of the Republican Party values was a belief that businessmen support the public good and that a man of business is someone that you can trust and put your faith in. Um, so we see a lot of pro-business thinking coming out of the Republicans of the 19th century, and they've been that way ever since. As we mentioned in the last lecture, railroads were part of the growth, and I just want to emphasize again that when the United States passed the Pacific Railroad Act in 1862 by giving government loans to railroads um, and one and a half million acres in land grants, that not only enabled the you know, settlement of the West, uh, but it linked the country, helped, creating, helped to create national markets. Um, it drove the Indians into reservations um, and helped make America the industrial powerhouse that it became. It is also an ecological disaster. When that transcontinental railroad is completed in 1869, it enables the manipulation of all of America's resources on a vast scale, lumber, mining, you name it. Um, people can get access to that, process it, and sell it. Um, as we've already said, it leads to the destruction of the buffalo or the bison in the West, um, increases mining, um, timber supplies, um, enables lots of industrialists to make money harvesting the timber um, in California, Oregon, and Washington, those old growth redwood forests. So powerful were the railroads that in 1883 they basically forced the rest of the United States to accept standard time zones because people were tired of getting on a train and then the train schedules not lining up because time was different um, as you moved across the country. Railroads were also highly, highly corrupt. Um, lots of wheeling and dealing, lying, bribery, fraud, deceit that even reached the level of the federal government. In 1872, the railroad officials of one company bribed federal uh, officials, including cabinet members, to support contracts to railroads in the Credit Mobilier scandal. Um, this included senators, um, congressmen, um, and it eventually would ensnare a lot of people um, and lead to the public thinking that you could not trust the railroads um, or the people who ran them. Here's once again the meeting of the two halves of the railroad in Utah, 1869. There's a map showing the rail connections across the United States. Uh, the several transcontinental lines that were operating, as well as the time zones they create so that the railroad schedules would line up. And you wouldn't miss your train. And here is me in front of a picture of a bison, because why not? This is in Toronto. It's just to show you how big they are um, and how if you hit one with a train, um, it's not necessarily... Uh, going to like blow up the train, but it'll do some damage. Railroads were in great competition with each other to buy each other out, to buy rival lines, um, to drive each other out of business. That's why in the game of Monopoly, you have railroads on the board. If you've ever wondered why are there railroads on the board, who cares about railroads? Well, it's because when that game was invented, buying and selling railroad properties and railroad lines was considered to be a big uh, deal. Americans clamored for some uh, protection against the railroads. And so in the 1880s, people began to bridle the iron horse, as the railroad was called. Um, states had begun doing this first. In Wabash versus Illinois, 1886, the Supreme Court ruled that states cannot regulate interstate commerce. So if the railroad only operates inside the state, well, a state can regulate that. 
But once a railroad crosses a state line, well, states can't regulate that. And if you think about it, all the railroads are going to cross state lines at some point. And so it makes a lot of sense to have national regulations instead. And that's where we get the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. To regulate interstate commerce, because railroads go across state lines, the Interstate Commerce Act allowed the United States government to prohibit rebates, where you give money back for special discounts to certain people that ship products on your railroad. It prohibited pools, which um, pooling was where a group of railroad people in a local area got together and decided that they would divide up the business and set whatever price they wanted, so there was no competition. It required railroads to publicize their rates, so you couldn't uh, have them changed on you. It outlawed discrimination, so railroads couldn't offer one rate to one guy because they liked him, but another rate to another guy because they didn't like him. It created an interstate commerce commission that would enforce the law, and basically it was almost worthless. Almost every single case that came before the ICC was won by the railroads. So this is a toothless law. By the 1880s, a lot of businesses were realizing that competition was ruining their ability to uh, achieve profits and to make money. Overproduction was leading to falling prices, lower profits, and the railroads and all the other companies were discovering, well, they just weren't making a whole lot much money anymore. So they began a process of forming larger and larger corporations to crush their competitors. We call these monopolies. When a company controls almost the entire market for a product, it monopolizes that market. One of the easiest ways to do this was to form a trust. All the stockholders for a company would allow trustees to run the company for them. So you might own stock in a railroad, but not make any decisions. Instead, you turn over decision-making power to a board of trustees. This had the benefit of bringing lots of companies together under the same board of trustees. You could have three railroad companies, but they all have the same board. Companies also began using ruthless business practices to drive their competitors into bankruptcy. Uh, railroads were particularly uh, notorious for doing this. Um, oil companies as well. And what they would try to do is outsell their competitors until their competitors were driven to bankruptcy and then swoop in and buy their competitor's company really cheap. Other ways of organizing your business to crush your competition included vertical integration, which is where you control every stage of production needed for making a product. And that means you have control over all the raw materials, all the shipping of the materials, making the materials, and selling the materials. So imagine for a moment you made macaroni and cheese. That's an easy product to imagine. Normally you just have a mac and cheese plant. But if you want to vertically integrate, you'd also own wheat fields where you would grow the wheat to make the flour that makes the pasta for your mac. You'd also own dairy farms so that you could make the cheese for your mac and cheese. You'd also own your own mac and cheese plant because that's what you do. You'd also own your own shipping plant and your own box making plant. So basically you'd own everything needed to make that product. The king of doing this was Andrew Carnegie, who was uh, one of the leading steel makers in the world by 1900. Now the other uh, way to drive out your competition and to become a monopoly is through horizontal integration, which is basically buying out all the companies that make the same product as you. The best example, that's John D. Rockefeller with Standard Oil. At one point, Rockefeller controlled 
90% of all oil production in the United States. By the 1890s, the public began to fear these giant monopolies and these trusts, arguing that they were so big that they were even bigger than the government itself. And this cartoon shows Rockefeller with the United States government in his hand. He's effectively larger and bigger and more powerful than the White House, than Congress. Other critics took that point of view a little bit more extreme and drew the trusts as monsters, often an octopus or some kind of many tentacled monster. So here is Standard Oil, the company by, owned by John D. Rockefeller, with its tentacles over the White House, uh, sorry, reaching for the White House over the Capitol. Um, it's crushing its competition with some of its tentacles. It's controlling ships. It is a monster. Same goes for this one. The Subway franchise monopoly, the Wire Trust monopoly in San Francisco, the Steel Trust. It's monstrous tentacles into every aspect of life. If you can um, imagine a company controlling just about everything, I think the best example would be in the movie Wally, -E, where the company, by and large, pretty much the superstore that runs the entire planet, uh, seems to be making decisions for all the people on the planet. In the end, this massive industrialization leads to uh, mass consumption of mass-produced goods. So people buying products that were made in a factory uh, that are identical to the other products made in the factory. Concentration of wealth. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Increasing generational poverty. So the working poor staying working poor and passing that poverty on to their children becomes a trend in the United States. It's harder and harder for people to rise up into the higher ranks of society. There's an environmental disaster, massive wide pollution all across the United States, though they hardly understood exactly the full effect of that until much later and then the wild economic mood swings that I mentioned earlier. So mass consumption is, emblem, uh, is emblematic of this time period. Um, you see it in the Sears Roebuck catalog, which you could buy everything, including a, an entire house from and have it delivered. Department stores like Montgomery Ward, uh, which would sell you just about every single thing that you could ever want on the planet. The first indoor shopping malls and large-scale shopping centers are built in this time period. Um, this is the interior of the Macy's in downtown um, Philadelphia. It was originally the Wanamaker's. And the Wanamakers actually featured an organ in it because they had concerts and plays and pageants and all kinds of things inside the store in order to attract people to get them to buy goods. The rich get so rich that in 1860 there are 400 millionaires, but by 1892 there are 4,000 millionaires and a whole heck of a lot of poor people. These millionaires build the massive homes of this time period that many of us like to tour and see uh, when we go to famous places where the millionaires lived, like Newport, Rhode Island, for example, or New York. One of my favorites is this house here, which is in Asheville, North Carolina. This is the Biltmore Mansion, built by the um, Vanderbilt family, 
opens uh, in 1895. And one of the leading thinkers of this time period, Thorstein Veblen, basically said that the rich are building these huge mansions and stocking them full of antiques as a way of showing off how much money they have. He called it conspicuous consumption. That is, when you are showing people that you have wealth by what you buy, by what you wear, by what you have in your house. So it's a form of uh, showing people just how awesomely rich you are. So if you ever get a chance to go see the Biltmore House, um, you should because it's basically a French chateau in the middle of the mountains of western North Carolina. This is what it looks like from the air. It's enormous. The largest private residence in the United States, 255 plus rooms. It has its own palm house and walled garden where they have tulips and roses, thousands of them. Something like a 15,000 azalea collection. That is their china cupboard. It's a two-floor china cupboard because, you know, all those fancy parties, you need lots of different kinds of china for that. Um, this is the dining hall with this enormous uh, three-opening uh, fireplace, card relief. Um, it actually has an organ on the backside here, a table um, that's exceptionally long, which you can seat like almost 50 people at a European tapestry on the wall. And the room is acoustically so well designed that you can talk from one end of the table to the other without shouting. Yes, the Biltmore House had its own bowling alley and indoor swimming pool. This is the library. Huge, massive fireplace volume upon volume upon volume of books and actually a little secret door back up here that led to Mr. Vanderbilt's uh, apartments upstairs so he could sneak down and get a book whenever he needed it. There's another view of the library showing you this enormous ceiling painting which came from Italy. Actually is an entire ceiling. They just removed it and brought it over to the United States. That wasn't the only house built by the Vanderbilts. This one was the home of Mrs. Vanderbilt in New York. Uh, has been since torn down. This is another one of their houses. And yet another one of the Vanderbilt properties. Meanwhile, you have children in grinding poverty in the United States, working themselves to death in these factories to support people like Vanderbilt. So that's the cost of all this wealth. You can have these fantastic homes at the cost of this poverty and misery for other people. Um, it's been calculated that about 1890 or so, the average life expectancy for someone who wasn't wealthy is about 48. And of course, there's the pollution from spewing all the smoke. Not that anybody at this time period understood what that meant or what it was doing, but eventually we would figure it out. More smoke and haze. And then the wild economic mood swings. It's like a roller coaster of ups and downs, and the economy's good, and then it crashes, and then it's up, and then it crashes, and then it really crashes, and it's up, and then it crashes again. All of that because these companies are so big that if any one of them goes out of business, it can bring the entire economy down with it. Of course, with all the influence of capitalists in the United States, the robber barons, there would be critics of capitalism. 
um, as well as defenders, and so we'll look at both of those groups. Among the critics, um, one of the most commonly leveled charges against the robber barons and those like them was that they were corrupt, that they had in essence perverted the political system to do whatever they wanted that benefited their corporations. One writer wrote that Standard Oil did everything to the Pennsylvania legislature except refine it. One of the leading capitalists, a robber baron, uh, once in an interview said, the public be damned. He didn't care what the public thought. So other writers uh, tackled the issue from the perspective of what to do about it. Henry George, in his 1879 book, Progress and Poverty, said that a single tax, uh, one tax on landed wealth, would reduce the social problems of monopolies and it would shut down the capitalists ability to hold on to vast sums of wealth. Edward Bellamy took a slightly different approach in his 1888 novel Looking Backwards which was about Boston in the year 2000, ooh in the future, um, and he imagined that in this Boston of 2000 class warfare would disappear because they had created the ideal socialist republic. So all labor discontent would be gone as a result of socialism. Defenders of capitalism um, usually approach the issue from the perspective of capitalists being self-made men. Now, the idea of a self-made man is pretty much impossible. There is no one at all ever who completely makes it entirely on his or her own. Uh, but in the 19th century, this idea was popularized so much uh, that people assumed that if you just worked hard, you would make it. You would rise to the top. Russell Conwell, one of the founders uh, of Temple University, wrote in his Acres of Diamonds that opportunity exists if you're willing to work for it. And of course we know that working hard is important and sometimes working hard is what makes the difference between you and someone else. But we also know that sometimes you work hard and you don't get very far. So it can't just be hard work. Conwell told a whole generation of Americans that hard work was the path to success. Horatio Alger and his Ragged Dick stories also preached the idea that hard work would lead to riches, um, though he had a slightly different take in that in his series, all of the boys had to face some choices about how they were going to spend their money and spend their time. And the boys who spent their time and their money wisely eventually got ahead in life. So his was a morality tale about the future that you want, that you make for yourself uh, by not only working hard, but being smart about the things you choose to do. The industrialist Andrew Carnegie justified capitalism's excess in wealth by saying that wealth is a gift from God. God bestows on people large sums of wealth, so don't hate on the rich because God gave it to them. But he also said that the reason God entrusted this wealth to the uh, rich was so that they could use it on behalf of the poor. The idea is the poor weren't smart enough to be trusted with large sums of money, so the wealth would spend it in ways that would benefit society and would help the virtuous poor rise and become better um, if they would take advantage of what's available to them. This argument was a pretty self-serving one um, in that it justified natural inequalities in wealth as totally be, being within um, the religious rationales for most people in America as well as being something you can't fight against because it's completely illogical and natural to exist. Here's some images of uh, Carnegie spending his money 
primarily what he did was he built libraries and hospitals and museums um, so here he's playing with some blocks that say library Columbus's own Metropolitan Library down on Grant Street, 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 sorry, I can't talk, is in fact a Carnegie Library. And there is Russell Conwell, a Baptist minister as well as founder of Temple University. Many of the industrialists did discover that by handing over vast sums of money to public endowments, um, and charitable organizations, they could deflect some of the criticisms against them, that they were wealthy beyond all, you know, reasonable means, um, and they didn't deserve those vast riches, or that they had gotten them through ill means. And by handing out large sums of money, they could, in essence, sort of say to folks, look, I'm rich, but I give back. So this shows all the leading industrialist philanthropic foundations from 1905 to 1925 and the endowments that they gave uh, to start these foundations. Defenders of capitalism also came from sociology um, and other related fields. People um, borrowing from the ideas proposed um, in Charles Darwin's Origin of Species. These guys, Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner, took an idea that was biological and they tried to apply it to a non-biological um, argument. So in effect, they made a huge error in their logic. And we now recognize today that the idea of the survival of the fittest is biologically appropriate but does not necessarily work very well for human relations and the way people treat each other. The idea that um, people who are best suited for surviving and surviving and passing on their genes um, became known as social Darwinism. And it also justified the huge inequities of wealth that we see at the uh, level of Carnegie and Rockefeller. Because those guys could simply say, look, I'm the fittest, I'm the richest, why shouldn't I pass on my riches to my children and uh, spend my money any way I want to? Plus, this social Darwinist idea said that if you tried to meddle with these fittest people, you would actually undermine the whole genetic um, argument for survival of the fittest. Government should not get involved in business because it would pick certain businesses to succeed or fail. And what if it picked the wrong ones, the ones that actually weren't fit? Then you might pass on bad traits and bad characteristics. Like I said, we now know that this is complete and utter nonsense because it's a biological idea that's applied wrongly to human relationships. Um, so we recognize that Spencer and Graham um, Sumner are, you know, highly educated idiots for their time. 